Państwu już za chwilę wykład o nim. Czas na Państwa pytania. 20 minut, dlatego proszę, abyście Państwo już się zastanowili nad ciekawymi pytaniami. A teraz zapraszam już tutaj do mnie Pana Profesora Jana Wiera. Sędziu Lublin. Before I came, I even did not realize that there were so many inhabitants in Lublin, and you have come, all of you. I'm very honored and thankful. We are here because of that, that this book has now been published in Polish, and uh, I know that there are some heaps out there, and, and uh, I will promise to, to sign all of them until midnight, if you like. Um, and also I should say that it's not a commercial project, because throughout my life I've had this principle uh, that if we have knowledge which are useful, it is for mankind, so I have not personally any economic interest in this book. I give it for free, and now it is in Polish, and I'm very proud and happy about that. Um, I shall tell today about that in the 21st century the cities are competing on livability. They are competing on quality. We have this global world and all the information are, are rushing around and we know everything about where there are nice good cities where the people, the citizens are having a good time and that is very important for where you settled and where the investments go, where the conferences go, where the tours go, where everything organizes. So, cities are really competing on livability now. And my point is that people-oriented city planning is a very efficient strategy towards having a more livable city, which will be better for the people. I shall start telling you about my life in a short version. I graduated as an architect in 1960. I was taught in School of Architecture in the 50s. And now I can see, looking back, that was the worst period of city planning ever. That was that, around that time. We were trained to do cities standing over models like this, Bingo, a nice city. And uh, I rushed out of university. Uh, of course, the big hero at that time was the modernists, and they were, became extremely influential. And the key modernist was Le Corbusier, and he was the one doing this sketch, showing his main idea cities are no good no more. Now, no more cities, no more streets, no more public spaces. Now we shall build freestanding buildings standing on grass. Grass is better than city. So I rushed out of university to do all these fabulous new things. Thing. And uh, then I married a psychologist. <laughs> and uh, then at once we started to have very interesting discussions in the house. Young architects, young psychologists. And all the time the psychologists say, why are you architects not interested in people? Why don't you study how people use the buildings you do? Why do you study how the cities work? What do you learn in school of architecture about people? And do you realize that whenever you do this thing, bingo, you manipulate the people's life? Oh. And we would say we were very concerned with people and we thought that aesthetics was one of the major things people dreaming of in the night, and they say, oh, that's only this much. But you know this little about people. That was very um, tough for a young architect to come into that machine. Actually, it made me think about that there was a point here. And also, um, yeah, and that made me, uh, uh, that made it necessary for me to go straight back to School of Architecture where I spent the next 40 years uh, doing research about how the built form influences the life of people. 
I was at a conference at one time in England where this architectural critic took up a bottle and said, I feel sorry for you architects because your mean of communication as architects, that's the still photo and the two-dimensional drawing. But by doing this and by communicating, communicating all these pictures on front pages, on magazines, you increasingly get more and more obsessed with the form. But this is not architecture, this is sculpture. Architecture is the happy interaction between form and life. And while it is very easy to communicate form and to study form, it is considerably more complicated to study life and especially complicated to study the interaction between life and form. And of course, that was exactly the area of research I started to do. That was about how does the form influence the life of people. And we found that form had an, an, an extremely high influence on what happened. First, you form the cities, but then they form you. Over the years, much to my surprise, there was much international and national interest in this kind of people-oriented city planning. And much to my surprise, I saw my, my puny little books be spread all over the world. And more and more books were published. Uh, and especially I was very humble and happy when say in Bangladesh and Vietnam, they thought they could use this kind of research to in their rebuilding their countries or developing their countries. So it came out in Bangladesh, in Vietnam, in Iran and in Krakow. And I'm also very, very proud that all my books have been translated into Chinese. And then you may think that uh, it's not distributed in China, that's not correct, because I've signed all of them personally, took several weeks, uh, or, 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 or almost all of them I've signed, so they are widely distributed. But what is a great sorrow for me is that they never had time to read them over in China. <laughs> um, and and I, I saw this fantastic new, charming new city, which obviously had read the books but not understood them. They thought it was charming because the main street was not under 20 meters but only 90. Charming. <laughs> so, I've had this great joy in my life to see this research I've been involved in being spread all over the world. And also at some point, rather, rather late in my life, there were so many mayors and other people in, in politics or in developing uh, building industry who came and said, you can criticize, you can write all these books where you say that we are doing wrong after one wrong thing after the other, but can't you come and tell us what we shall do instead of writing and criticizing? And then I had to start a company with many of my, form, my, my students. And um, so now we have also this consulting company. And much to my surprise again, in just 15 years when we have been working, we have seen that cities from all over the world have come rushing to say, can you help us to more, make a more livable city? Up north there will be Luke, the capital of Greenland. Down south there will be Christchurch where we helped them with a plan to rebuild after the big earthquake. Over in the west there will be Seattle, San Francisco and Los Angeles actually. And in the other end there will be Shanghai and then in Australia there will be many cities. And it's so, it's so amazing that so many cities all over the world really increasingly want to be more livable, make better cities for people. Even Moscow has not appeared on the map, as you can see. I'll tell you more about that later. Then, in, many, in quite many years of my life, we had in Denmark a very stinking rich foundation for the built environment, 
and they took an interest in this people-oriented city planning, and they said, you're doing this city plan, uh, people-oriented city planner. We think it's a great, great area to research. Do you need any money? And then they started to say, how many millions do you actually need? And we said, no, yeah, yes, yes, please, thank you very, thank you very much. Then we had a research center in the university, the Center for Public Space Research. But then after I stopped in the university, they came again and said, yeah, we would like you to sit down and write down everything you know in one book while you can still remember it. And I said, you must realize I have no time for that. And they said, isn't time a matter of how many assistants we can give you? And then after a while, I said, oh yes, I, I have time now. So we made this book and it has now, in very few years, much again, to my surprise, come out all over the world, even in French, as you can see. It took 40 years. The French, they are of course interested in people, but not in people who are not French. <laughs> uh, so it was published in, in French Canada, in Montreal. Um, and also, yeah, there's the Russians, yeah, and then the, the Greeks. The Greeks came and said, we would like to publish your book. I said, no, 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 you should use your money for something better here. <laughs> no, don't waste them on, on my, my book. No, don't you worry, because it's paid for by the Danish embassy. <laughs> so, it's out, and now out in Polish also. I'll tell you a little bit about the message in this book. It's very much a story about the two paradigms, the two planning paradigms which have been all dominating in the 20th century. And then about a recent shift to another paradigm. Um, we can go back and say that before, and I say that around 1960 was the time when the big change of paradigms happened. And that was also the time when I graduated. So I have seen the whole Buddha book. Before that, we had more or less traditional city planning where we built one building at a time, we built along streets, and a lot of things were done by people in spaces for people where you carried your things and you met your friends and kissed your girls and whatever. So like in Venice, which is an old traditional city, we had all these traditional cities with traditional street life, whatever, whatever. But then came two influences which had was to have enormous influence. The first change of paradigm was the car invasion, which happened at various times. I know that in Poland it happened uh, some 30 years later than in Denmark or in Australia or America or, or in England. Uh, but we, we had the car invasion. Cheap petroleum, cheap gasoline, and we had these thousands and thousands of cars who came in and filled all the spaces in the cities. We can go out here and see how it looked like back then in 1960s and 70s. And then all energy in cities were then concentrated on making, on solving the traffic problems and later on also on making the cars heavy. And all cities at once started to have a very efficient transport department and they also had very efficient statistics about all the, the things related to traffic. They count all the cars every year going east and west and they have prognosis, they have models, they know everything about traffic and every time there is a planning proposition, the transport engineers have all the, the data ready. Look here, Mr. Mayor. We need extra lanes. But do you know in this period of any cities who had a department for pedestrians and public life? And do you know of any cities in this period who started to have knowledge about how the people were using the city and how the people were reacting to the car invasion? Actually, nowhere were there any concerted effort to look after the people in the cities. 
So we knew everything about traffic, but nothing about people, and that gave a big uh, imbalance in city planning. What we know that is that gradually more and more human qualities were salami, by salami technique taken out of the cities, and we lost the, the sense of quality. We lost to the, the memory of how nice cities could be, and whenever we came home and had not been killed that day, we thought that was a very good day. We have a good city, I was not killed today. But the quality was not there no more. Much of the joy of being in the city had gone. Of course, of course when we talk about all this, we know that it is worse in Romania. But now they have the book, so I think that soon they will sort out this traffic jam. But we shall see. The other change of paradigm which happened around the time was the, the big scale introduction of modernism planning principles. And again, this was this thing, and we started to do a complete different type of, of cities where we used freestanding buildings placed away from the streets, and the streets were more and more full of cars, so it was maybe a good idea. And these guys were about the radical. This is Corbusier's plan for the new Paris. He thought Paris would be much better if you took away Paris and put up 24 high-rise buildings, put all the Parisians into the high-rise buildings so they can see the grass, and then they could sit there and be happy with their red wine up in the high-rise. Um, this is how drastic this modernism actually was. What happened with the modernists was that they actually said that now we have a modern world, we have a modern man, everything shall be different from everything in the past, we shall build no more cities, we shall do everything different than we did, and we shall not use any of the experience we had through several thousand years of human settlements in cities and settlements. We can do better, said the modernists. And that was, of course, what I was brought up with in School of Architecture. What happened around 1960 were, literally, because all the cities in, 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 in the world started at that point because of uh, economic situation was better and because the health situation was better, medicine, doctors, whatever. So we started to have Great, great expansions in the cities. We should build big new areas and what was very easy to use at that time was to use modernism because that was very simple. Um, and to overview it, the planners went up in aeroplanes and started to organize like this. Um, so the city planning was done from high up and from above. The site plans were done more or less from the rooftops or from the helicopter where you moved around and put down the blocks. But what, what actually was not looked after was the, left, the spaces left over between the buildings where the people were supposed to be. No profession, neither landscape architects or architects or planners or traffic planners were trained in any way to look after the little scale. The little scale was simply overlooked. And that, maybe, is the most important of all the states. And that's why we had all these awful new housing areas. I call this development the Brasilia syndrome, because at that time, the capital of Brazil, Brasilia, was made. It was, from, for the modernists, it was the big mecca, Brasilia. And we all had to study um, how the Costa and Nehemiah made Brasilia, and Brasilia was wonderful. From the air, from the aeroplane, Brasilia is an eagle, and the head of the eagle is a parliament. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and also, Nehemiah, he did all these wonderful, the parliament and all these wonderful monumental ministries along the big parks. Um, wonderful. But then, if you go to Brasilia, you realize that down at eye level for the people, Brasilia is shit. 
Nobody ever thought that there would be any Brazilians walking in this city. And maybe they thought they had money to keep all Brazilians a helicopter so they could enjoy Brasilia, but they had no helicopters, so they just walk endlessly around in this wasteland, Brasilia. That's what I call the Brasilia syndrome, looking good from the air, but not good where you are. And they still do it, actually. This way of building has been very persistent through all these many 50 years. And in Dubai, it's still Brasilia syndrome. And also, we started with the global, with the global uh, world situation to have the um, bird sheet architects who fly around and drop high-rise anywhere they can send a skyscraper they come and dump the skyscraper without concerning much about where it lands and how it lands. And I can tell you something that dropping skyscrapers does not make a good city automatically, not at all. So we still have Brazilian syndrome in many places. So the planners have not really learned much about people and have not really, in this period, taken much care of people. One would think then that the architects would be the heroes who looked after people. But in all these 50 years, I do think that the architects have become increasingly competitive with each other and the internet and whatever websites, and they also started to compete more and more on funny shapes so that the form became the focus I know it because I've been in School of Architecture for so many years and taught in many schools. And I know that increasingly form was the focus of the interest. If you go around down in Dubai and look at the buildings, you realize they look exactly like the bottles in my wife's, the perfume bottles in, in the bathroom. And, and so that every architect has been seen, well, how can I make it a little bit more? For me, maybe this would be the thing to do here. So they make funny shapes, but they do not make good cities. So you think that it could not be any worse, but it can. Uh, this is an ex exhibition in the trade modern about the glory of modern city planning. You can do city planning with anything, with with biscuits and. Lecoris, licorice, and whatever. So you think it cannot be any worse, but it can. Uh, this is one of the newest housing residential projects in New York by Frank Geary in Brooklyn. The people in Brooklyn are not at all happy about this. They don't think Brooklyn would be a better place the more of these funny buildings will come in. So we see this competition on funny shapes rather than on quality in all these years. If I take a look at how people, the general people around the world look at these developments, you can find that they never at any point liked this kind of, of planning and this kind of architecture. The world is full of cartoons and criticism where people say, yeah, it may be good architecture, but I don't like to live there or to be there. Here is from Australia, and they are more precise about who could be the reason for the problem here, main peak architects. So one could conclude that, not, that the architects are not interested in people either. That is absolutely wrong. The architects, or we architects, we love people. Life and people is the best thing we know, because every time we hand in a competition project, it's crawling with happy people who go about doing things which you've never seen people do anywhere. We call it unspecified public life. That means people doing things they would never do in real life, and for too many of them. You can see all the projects, whether it's good or bad project, they're always crawling with happy people, because happy people is a sign it must be a good project, or they would not be there. They would have gone home or never come out, 
So if there are people, it must be good, but it's not enough to have people on the perspective drawings. Here is a perspective drawing from a new project in Sydney, and as you can see, all the inhabitants of Sydney have come down here in the last time to see what good project it would be. Here, when Liebeskind, Daniel Liebeskind, finishes his two high-rise in Copenhagen, suddenly this area will come to life and people will spring out of the buildings and populate the place. They will be lively ever after. Even in Los Angeles, you can see that the moment you do this project, they jump out of their cars and start to walk up and down and doing nothing. Um, so there is great interest in people on perspective drawings and instinctively we all have the feeling that people are important, that it's important that places become lively, that we make architecture and cities in such a way that people would love to be there. But there is a big gap between this instinctive feeling and what is really happening. This is a, promen a brand new promenade in London by Norman Foster next to the town hall, go and have a nice walk there in London. Enjoy, enjoy. This is a wonderful page by Ren Bolas in Lille, where you can sit and think about philosophy or something. <laughs> this is a bench somewhere in the waterfront, um, where you maybe can bring your girlfriend there and explain what a wonderful world is waiting her if she marries you. The world is full of these silly things where there is this fantastic gap between what people dream about and where people are comfortable and what is actually many times offered to them. I shall end this part, and this is very much what this first part of the scene in the book is about, to tell about these paradigms which in various ways change our mindset one of the things which happened is that our sense of human scale was completely shattered because the cars and the speed of the cars shattered the understanding of good human scale. And then the modernists with their big buildings and the big spaces, whatever, they also blew the scale. So human scale is something you had before 1960. Or maybe it's coming back now. I'll end by telling you about this little housing area in Pumping. It's two three-story row houses. And the interesting thing about this area, which is called the Potato Rose, and it is famous because it is not interesting at all from an airplane. It's really boring. And from a helicopter, it's really boring. If you came up with this in a, in a school of planning and say, this is my plan, for this new residential area, they would say, are you crazy? Have you got any visions? Have you got any creative things? Is that all you can come up with? But now between the buildings, it's got all the qualities you can speak of. We have a list of 12 qualities which you should try to build into any project if you want people to have a good time. And in this case, all 12 are greatly observed. And here they are sitting, the, the inhabitants, they are having a great time and they have such a good time that they have not time to be sorry that it doesn't look fine from an aeroplane and a helicopter. Because what is really important is what it look where you are, where your children are and where your grandparents are. And then there is an extra little story because this particular area is the highest priced dwellings of residences in Copenhagen. So these kind of qualities are highly valued. And also, if you look closer, you find in this area the highest concentration of architect families in Denmark. They are all living here. Half of the professors of School of Architecture live here. The Prime Minister lives here. The head of city planning lives here. So, all these guys, they know exactly that it is what is there where you are, which is more, most important. And there is a discrepancy between this kind of 
of understanding qualities and what is going to be done in new areas. So, this one message is part of this book that the most important scale of all of them is the people scale. It's the city, the qualities at high level, and when you are walking with five kilometers an hour. And if you have not energy to do the air aircraft scale and the helicopter scale and the people scale, then only do the people scale because that's the important one. If you can do the other ones, fine. People scale, that's what counts. And that what has been so sorely missed in these 50 years with these kilograms. We have now definitely a new set a new paradigm has arrived and are rapidly being introduced all over the world. <coughs> because if you ask mayors of cities, would you like a livable, sustainable and healthy city for your citizens, they would say, like I'm sure your mayor here, um, that is exactly what we want in this city. And so, we we are seeing, and, and this livability thing, that's much more about quality than about quantity. It's not about how big it is and how high it is, it's about what quality does it give for you and your family, and what it does it give for you when you get old. And we know that one of the most sure things we know about the future is that we'll see more and more old people in our cities, which will put new demands on good quality of cities. We increasingly are interested in good public spaces and good lively city districts and in livable cities. We have, there are so many things have changed in our lives. We live more in smaller and smaller households. We get older and older. We have more space each of us, so we live more and more spread out. We have all these electronic communication. We have all these pictures. But that's not the same as having a real access to other people. And we have this increasingly privatized life where we can organize everything without coming out of the house at all. But man was all the time a social animal. And we have seen in all this period of the digital introduction that at the same time the life in the public spaces have grown and grown and grown. Because if you have access to the real thing, to places which are wonderful when the sun is shining and nice fellow citizens from your neighborhood are gathering, you would like to go there. The children would like to see how the world looks and so would you. And we can... The world, throughout the history of man, see people in the city, the other people have been the main attraction and it still is. And I think that the more indirect communication, the more important it is with the direct meeting. We also see that we can see cities who specifically say that for the reason of supporting democracy and, and in social inclusion in our community, we have a specific policy that people should use the public spaces and meet the other people in society. They should not hear about them. They should meet them and see that even if you are poor or young or old, they are nice people, nearly all of them. And that is my society. This is my democracy. This is my city. So they have this policy that it is not good if people stay home all the time, but we should have good public spaces. And luckily, when we have good public spaces, people use it to high extent. Then we had a new driver, a very important driver. Ever since Brundtland Report in 1987 started to point out that we have a serious problem with global heating, uh, global warming and with, with, the, with, the, with the climate, we know that all over the world we have to do something for the sustainability. We also know that major bulk of problems comes from the cities, so it's in the cities we should do especially much to do something to address the climate challenge. And then again we know that the more 
green mobility you have in your city, the better for the climate. The more people walk or bicycle, that's of course good for the climate, but if we are to get away from having motor cars and using other types of mobility, if we are to use, which I think we will see in the next 20 years, much, much more use of very good public transportation, then good public rail and good public transportation, they are actually brothers and sisters, because to have a good public transportation, you must have a good way to walk down there, or to bicycle down there, or to get your bicycle with the train or the tram, whatever, so that it becomes a system and it's got high quality all over the place. Finally, we've had a new challenge, uh, a more recent challenge. We have find, come to realize that for 50 years we made city planning, which invites people to be more and more unhealthy, to sit on, on their behind all life and just be more and more sick. We know now from America that more people die out of inactivity than die out of smoking. Um, so this inactivity is really a problem. We have made the world so you can really do everything without moving a muscle. And city planning has been very active in this. We also realize that in city planning we can make cities where naturally we again realize that we are walking animal, we are meant for walking, and we know that if we walk for one hour, one hour of moderate exercise or, or, or activity, maybe two half hours of walking or half an hour walking, half an hour bicycling, we will be f much better off. We will, as average, live seven years longer as those who doesn't. And it would be much cheaper for society because the problems of all this inactivity comes especially in the old age when there is a number of health costs with hospitals and doctors and whatnot with these people who are not in a good shape when they get old. So we know that there is an enormous benefit for society if we can have people to move more naturally. The idea that everybody would be so sense, so, um, uh, so um, um, clever as to use time and money to go to fitness centers three times a week. That was a beautiful idea, but we know now that it's some people who does it, and you do it in special periods, but in a long life, there are many periods where you don't have time and energy and motivation to do your, your walking or to do, go to the fitness center or whatever. And that's why we now see cities all over the world say, Let's make city planning so that people move naturally in the course of their daily day. Sometime, somewhere along the way, something went terribly wrong. So, we have this new paradigm today. We want lively, sustainable and healthy cities. And actually, if we look carefully after people in city planning, we efficiently address exactly these three issues. And that's very much what this new book is about. So I'll tell you a little few stories about how the kind of thinking in this particular book, how that is being applied here and there. I should invite you to the city of Copenhagen, my home city, Copenhagen is one of the cities where the city council have voted that in this city we'll do everything we can to have people walk more and bicycle more. And they do it for a number of good reasons, climate, health, livability, and economy. Um, and in, in Copenhagen, they actually started 50 years ago. It was one of the first in Europe to start to say, hey, all these cars, maybe it's not so good, maybe we push them back. So they pushed back the cars in the first streets 50 years ago, and they have worked for 50 years now to make the city a little bit better for people every day. Um, 
they were among the very first, and nobody believed that it was possible to make the desert areas in Scandinavia. They said, we are Danes, we are not Italians, we will never come out and use these spaces. Then they cleared them of traffic anyway, next year we were Italians. And we have become more and more Italian in all the 50 years. Because again there has been changes in society, people have much more leisure time and recreation time, there are much more energy and many more cultural initiatives, whatever. We have easily enough time to utilize good public spaces if we have them. So Copenhagen started a long series of, of improving the city year after year. I have been married for 50 years. And sometimes my wife and I talk about that it's fantastic to be in a city where in all the time we've been married, we knew every morning when we woke up that the city would somehow be a little bit better than it was yesterday. And that is something which every city should strive to make this good survey, we will get better every, every, every day. I know of many cities like Mexico City or other cities which every morning they know for sure that is a little bit worse than yesterday. Also, Copenhagen was the first city in the world where the life of the city was studied systematically and that the information about life was fed back to the politicians so that they did not only have information about the traffic but also they had information about how people use the city. And that proved to be a very strong medicine for the, for the politicians. When I retired from university, uh, we were the, or developing all these studies in the university. I got this letter from the mayor saying, if you guys in the university had not given us all this information about the life of the city, we politicians would never have dared to make Copenhagen one of the nicest cities in the world. So they got courage out of finding that what, when they did this, people liked it and it worked well, and then they did another project. Just to give you an idea, uh, this is the very first project from 1962, and this is the most recent map of the city center. It's not that they have taken the colors out of all these spaces, but all these spaces have been organized so that they are wonderful spaces for people and public life. Sometimes also with cars, we should not be fundamentalistic. We love cars, but we don't want them to dominate. Also, we've seen in all these years increasingly that this, the, the public spaces are not shopping streets. Now, increasingly, they are geared towards exercise, towards activity, towards swimming and running and enjoying and playing. And so, more and more, joy and recreation and culture are coming into the public spaces as we are now in 50 years later in the development of public spaces and there are more and more of them. Copenhagen now has this policy to be, this was passed in 2009 in City, city Council, we decided to be the best city for people in the world. And they have here specific goals how they will be the best city for people in the world. And every year they go out and study and count the people and see what's going on. And then they assess each of these goals and say, here we are close to the goal, here we have to do more, here. So that they follow every year what's going on with the people side of it. So they make sure that it really becomes a better city every day. Of course, I brought this one to give to the mayor of Lublin as a special gift from Copenhagen. One of the things which are happening in Copenhagen is that it's not about the city center. This policy is about the whole city. And that's why they change the streets all over the city so they get more and more comfortable and invite people to walk also in the residential districts and in the suburbs. Here is a typical old street which was just asphalt and the modern street which is two lanes of traffic, one big median, street trees, bicycle lanes, sidewalk. Much more beautiful, much safer 
and it can take almost the same traffic as the old street could because modern transport engineers are much smarter than they were in the 1970s. So Copenhagen is transforming itself. We have not yet come to this stage, but we are doing something which I think is very smart. That is, every time a small street goes into a bigger street, you take the sidewalk and the bicycle lane of the big street across so that the cars from the small street have to go over the sidewalk and go to the big street. And I thought this was rather nice, showing respect for pedestrians and bicycles. Fine. But then my daughter told me something. She said, oh, we've got this new system in our neighborhood, and would you imagine? Now, Laura is my granddaughter. She's seven. Now she can walk all the way to school because she can stay on the sidewalk all the way to school. She doesn't have to cross any streets anymore. And that is fantastic difference for seven-year-old if you have to cross three streets or if your sidewalk goes through and the Mercedes-Benz have to cross three sidewalks. Simple but very, very important little changes. Another part of the Copenhagen story is working with the bicycles. They, there was a time in the, in the 60s where they thought bicycles were in the way of progress, progress meaning more cars, and they did certain things to get bicycles out of the way. Like in, in Beijing and Shanghai, they had prohibited bicycling in a number of streets. Now they have changed it there also. But in Denmark, after the oil crisis, 1973, they said, oh, I should for God's sake, that was a good idea. They decided to do something for it instead of getting rid of them. Now, Copenhagen has a complete network of bicycle lanes in all the major streets, all the important streets, and bicycle lanes with a curb here and a curb there. And it has developed into a complete transport system. You can transport anything with bicycles. Every third family with children in Copenhagen have a cargo bike and they take the kids to school and kindergarten in the cargo bike. And the kids like much more to sit in the cargo bike and see what's going on than to be strapped into a car on the rear seat. Um, so that's one thing. But anything can be transported if you have a good bicycle network. And over the years it's become more and more safe especially the crossings are the, are the critical points and here they have found a number of smart things. To have a good bicycle system, you will have to integrate it with the other transport system so it becomes a real system. So all the taxis must take two bicycles. You cannot discuss that. If your girlfriend has a puncture, the taxi must take both of you. Also, in the trains, you can take your bicycles for free, and that is very, very popular, because then you can pedal down to the station, go 20 kilometers, and then pedal down to, in this case, my son's family. So my wife and I, we are in the, the mid-70s. We can bicycle two kilometers, get a little bit of fresh air and exercise, take the train 20 kilometers, bicycle two kilometers, visit the sun, and grandchildren and bicycle back to the train. Then we have uh, a, tra a trip which is very uncomplicated and gives a bit of exercise and whatever. Over the years, and they work on this in many years, there's become really, there's developed a bicycle culture. In Copenhagen, bicycling is what everybody does. I think that the average Copenhagener had 1.4 bicycles or something like that, and everybody bicycles, businessmen and pregnant women and children, elderly people, whatever. The crown prince even bikes here with his little child, which is half Australian, and that shows that even Australians can learn to bike if they start early. In Copenhagen, we are now in a situation where 41% of everybody going to work arrive to work or university on their on bicycles. And driving a car is down to 24% of those going to work. And um, do we have winter? Yes, we have winter. 
I guess you have many more for here. In Denmark, seventy <laughs> percent continue to bike during the winter, and one of the tricks is that there is strict rules from the from the city government that if there is snow, the first thing you should clear is the bicycle lanes, because when there is snow, the cars go very careful, and nothing happens in the street. If anything happens, boom, ah, but no. No, no injury. But if there's slippery on the bicycle lanes, you can fall and it could be serious. So they say start with the bicycle lanes, continue with the sidewalk. If you have more capacity, go and clean the snow from the roads. Also in Copenhagen now, they have another policy saying we will also be the best in the world for bicycles. And I did make a special issue here so I can give it to the mayor later on for inspiration. So in Copenhagen we have no problems. Yes, we have serious problems now. Because we have this awful congestion in Copenhagen on the bicycle lanes. There are far too many bicycles. And in some streets there are 40,000 bicyclists every day. Oreo. What do we do? What they are doing is now making a big program of doubling the width of the bicycle lanes. Where do they get the, the, the asphalt from? They take it from the cars or from the parking. Because it's very good transport economy. Because a bike lane can take five times more people than a car lane. So if there's enough bicycles, it's good economy to get, give them the space which they do. Also, they've been forced to uh, put double, double the capacity in the trains because it's very popular. And what could be the effect of all these things? Yeah, one of the things is that whenever you see a list of most livable cities in the world, you are very frequently will find Copenhagen at the very top. This is a monitor list to say thousand last year and again this year, Copenhagen, world's most livable city. And the mayor and all the politicians say they, they clap their hands because it's good for economy to be most livable. Because that's good for investment and uh, all these things. Then the other year we had a new government in Denmark because it's not only Copenhagen, it's also a bit, a bit Denmark here. And when the ministers were going to the Queen to have their commissions, they said now it's not the time anymore for limousines. We go on the bicycles up to the queen, and then they went to the to the royal carts and say, "Would you look after my bicycle while I go to the queen?" And no, no bicycles were stolen that day. That was a great day. So, and and what is this? This is not my grandmother or my mother. It is a Danish minister of culture, and I, of course, I think that I'm very happy that she, she chose to sit with my little humble book. She was asked to pose for a series of European cultural ministers reading their favorite book. And she said, yeah, I took your book so people can see. I took the English version so people can see what I'm interested in. And that is very nice to be in a country where the cultural minister reads about cities of people. And this cultural minister also just launched the new Danish national architectural plan. It was not something about let's make more export of building materials. It's about let's put people first in architecture policy. That is very comforting for an old man to see these developments and see these things happening. So that was the export version of the Danish story, Copenhagen story. I couldn't, I couldn't invite all of you to come up and see yourself, especially the city council um, and the planning officers. We have so many visitors to see what they have been doing. And I think it's quite interesting. Do we find similar policies in other cities? Yes, increasingly we do, more and more cities. I could invite you to the city of Melbourne who have all the same policies and Copenhagen. And they have done miracles. Um, they've done miracles in Melbourne 
it looks like any American or Australian city, and in the old days it was famous for being completely uninteresting, full of offices, no people, a, a 9 to 5 city, not a 24 hour city. It was called the Donut, something or nothing in the middle. They decided that they would do whatever they can to invigorate Melbourne. And then they have made this big program that in Melbourne we walk, we invite people to walk, we invite them on the sidewalk, put granite on all the sidewalk, put trees for shade, put fantastic nice street furniture. We do everything to signalize that here you should walk. And they also took to some extent the cars out of the city centre. They stepped up the number of people living in the city centre by 10 times in 10 years. And it's now gone way up again. Um, so here is from Melbourne one of the streets which have been their main street now have more pedestrians than Regent Street in London. They're very proud of that. And if you go to Melbourne today, it's such a nice city. I think it's like it's got all the ambience and atmosphere like Paris. But the weather is better in Melbourne. So we have followed what's happening in Melbourne and we can prove that all these improvements have made, led to many more people now using Melbourne being much more active by day and by night. <coughs> also, the figures showing that all the important economic factors are up if in the consumer and, and leisure time society you are sweet to people, you are also sweet to economy. So there are more turnover, more jobs, higher real estate values and so on. What are they doing now in Melbourne? They are full speed doing a Copenhagen type bicycle system. What is Copenhagen type? That is to have the park cars to protect the bicycles instead of having the bicycles to protect the cars. And if you are in doubt about where to go in this world, I could suggest that you move to Melbourne because it is one of the amazing cities in this world. I could go on, and you fear I would. Uh, and tell about other Australian cities like Sydney, which are doing a lot now to copy Melbourne. They're always competing. And shortly in Sydney, they will have their main street emptied of buses and cars, and they will have tram and, and pedestrians. And in all these cities, They've done exactly like we did in Copenhagen. They, <coughs> they have started to have data about the people so that the people use of the city has become well known um, and part of the policy making system. And if we take a list of the world's most livable city as it was in 2013, <coughs> we can see that exactly Melbourne and Copenhagen are the very top. And in all the yellow ones, I know they have used this strategy of taking a strong interest in the life and use the information and data about the life to improve the situation for life in the cities. I will end by telling about two of the cities which are slightly bigger than Brooklyn. But another city who has made this decision, in this city we walk and bicycle, that is New York. In 2007, the mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, he promised the rest of the world's cities, we will be the most sustainable metropole in the world inside my period as a mayor. That was strong medicine. He said, it's meaningless to take commuter cars into Manhattan, he had one million commuter cars coming into Manhattan every day. We have, we have a very good subway system, we have a flat city, we have concentrated buildings, we have wide streets. It's a perfect city for bicycling, so you take the subway, you take your bike, or you walk, or you combine these things. That is, was the strategy. 
There was a lot of people walking in New York from, they only shuffled from the subway to the office and back. There was not a single bench in New York and there was not as, almost no sidewalk cafes at all. You could sit nowhere and enjoy New York, you could shuffle to, to New York. They used the bicycles to protect the parked cars. It was not very good for the bicycles, and they have here a poster about the situation for bicycles in New York at that point. Then, the first thing uh, Michael Bloomberg did was to appoint two bright uh, ladies as, as transport commissioner and planning commissioner. And two weeks later, they popped up in Copenhagen, Janet Sadiq Khan and um, Amanda Burton, they grabbed two bicycles, they were there for 48 hours, they got pedaled all over Copenhagen, and we could not get the bicycles from them in the night even, and only in the airport we got the bicycles back, and they said, we want a city like this one, when can we start? And I was quick, I said, let's start on Monday, because they're Americans, they want to get going, so they said, let's start on Monday. So, they started right away with putting in 5,000 kilometers of bicycle lanes. They decided for a bicycle, citywide bicycle system. They are putting it in in great numbers. Here is um, in the morning on 9th Avenue and in the evening on 9th Avenue, or maybe in the spring and in the summer. And they're doing it in all the boroughs in Queens and Brooklyn and Bronx and State Island. And also, they started to think that if with all these people going around in New York, we need some good public spaces where they can rest and enjoy New York. We have Times Square, but it's not a square, it's a traffic roundabout. In Times Square, 90% of all the space was allocated to traffic and 10% for pedestrians. And if you counted the people, 90% of the people were on the sidewalks and 10% were in the cars. So, and, uh, so it was figured out that maybe they needed a Shams EDC of the Americas, could be Broadway Boulevard, sounds good. And then they, we worked further with them and found out that they did not need Broadway in the traffic circulation. Actually, traffic could be smarter if they didn't have traffic on Broadway, because then they didn't have funny crossings. So, in 2009, in the spring, Times Square looked like that. It was decided to close all the crossings of Broadway with, with the major boulevards, all the crucial places where there were tons of people, and so, it was Herald Square, it was Madison Square, it was Union Square, and it was Times Square. Here's what Times Square looked like in early 2009, and this is a little bit later in 2009. Many people were very worried and saying that this is uh, the Big Apple and we cannot use European ideas in Big Apple. We need yellow taxes. But the, the mayor said, this is an experiment, don't worry. And then half a year later he came back and said, experiment, no more, no way. It's the biggest success for 100 years in New York City planning. It's going to stay. It is there. And it's now used for all kinds of funny things like yoga classes. And in the New Yorker you can see this. This is the future of Times Square with a bit more regulation and more cheap here. So, it has resounded enormously that they can do these kind of things, that they can put in bicycle lanes and stop, uh, do what they can to reduce the commuter traffic, and they, they, can, they can turn Broadway, uh, close Broadway to traffic and make it. They made now 50 people squares in New York on the model of Times Square, and they are very successful. So it has resounded around the United States, but actually around the world. And you know that about Broadway, we have Frank Sinatra, he will be singing, when you can make it there, you can make it everywhere. Look in, look in, look in. Um, anyway. The mayor in Moscow.
Moscow, he heard it. And just a little bit later, at a conference in Montreal where I was speaking, the, the deputy mayor came running up to me and said, what you done in New York? We need this bridge in Moscow. When can you come? Monday. I said, and, and we agreed that. And then we went to Moscow and heard that they wanted us to humanize Moscow in 12 months. Um, Moscow had a little problem with the traffic because they got the cars rather late and they got a very strong love affair with the motor car and also I think they have a special rule that freedom from communism is the right to park everywhere and they do. So this is one of the streets, this is an ordinary Moscow street, you have a good time here. Here is a it's a little uh, pedestrian crossing where you can also train for slalom for the Winter Olympics. Here is the Main Street, Moscow, Tverskaya, where of course they have parked cars all the way down Tverskaya on the sidewalk, and they have icicles on the houses, so they have one meter left for Main Street, Moscow, for people to pass. They came to me and said, Jan, yeah, how many books have you read? Uh, we published them. Mm, yes. And in three months, they published all the books. Um, the, the man who's worried is the Danish ambassador. Um, he's published by the city of Moscow. There's a seal of Moscow in the corner of all of them. And I personally made sure that they have read them. And then we got commissioned by Moscow to come and make a study of what was the problems in Moscow and how could you do something about them. In the process of going there, I was invited again to Mr. Sertsubiani and he said, what would you say in your reports about Moscow? I said, yeah, maybe parking on Main Street, sidewalks on Main Street in Moscow is not the greatest idea I ever heard about. And then two months later, I came back. We had not published anything, but there were no cars on the sidewalk on Main Street in Moscow because their democracy is very efficient. <laughs> and if you forget the new rules, actually they started to have parking rules um, because they have to, with what every city has to start to do it in one point. Moscow has started. And Mayor has this little car which goes up and down Main Street. And if you forget your car, you go and say to Siberia. Um, <laughs> And you only do that once, then you remember that you remember. You see, this is very, very brutal. But in Lithuania, the mayor, he uses a, a tank to go over cars which are parked in bike lanes. And they remember it. If you, the cities have been run over by a tank, you remember it. Um, and this then is a, is a miracle of Moscow. A year and a half later, you come back to Tverskaya. No cars are parked anymore. No advertisements are up in the sky. It's not a grey street anymore. It's become a little bit of a green street, the beginning of a green street. All the way where there were cars and now benches. And in the distance you can now see Kremlin, which were in the end all the time, but you couldn't see all these signs. To me, this is an absolutely a miracle when Moscow can start to make steps towards being a livable city. Then everybody can do it. And that shows how widespread this movement, and this change of paradigm is coming. So now you can see the mayor of Moscow sitting at conferences talking about this is the way you should take to make a livable city. We've come a long way since 1960, and I'm very happy about that. And I'm very happy about that now this little Chubby book is out in books, and I, I would urge you to read it and not do like the Chinese, and just pretend you read it. But I hope that you will find inspiration, and I wish you welcome to the 21st century. Thank you.